important to, to gauge what type of content you have today. So is that format, are your materials currently in print? And if so, if you're looking to digitize those, um, how many items do you need to digitize and how long is that process? Um, these are factors when you're looking at the timeline for your project. Certainly, if you have resources that are in electronic format or mixed media today, or if you have audio and video resources, getting those online may be faster than getting print materials online. If you're looking at document types, the format and the size of those documents are also things to consider, especially if you're talking about other formats of files. If you've got very large or very long video files, that may be something to consider in your structure for your e-library. And with content, it's also important to look at the types of documents and the way that users are going to interact with those. So do you have long documents that are very text heavy? Or is your document collection more shorter magazine style publications that have a lot of formatting and, and imagery in them? And if that's the case, the way you present those documents may be very different. It's also important to look at how users are going to interact with your content. So are they coming to flip through a magazine? Are they coming to read materials in detail? Will they be able to print or copy or email those materials or save a local copy of them? And, and how that users are going to interact with them determines some of the policies for your e-library. Um, you'll also want to consider your content strategy. And we'll get into this a little bit later in some of the, the slides to come. but just Thinking beyond getting the content into the e-library, it's important to think about day two and when you come to your e-library when it's up and running and how you're going to maintain and add and enrich that content on a daily basis and whether you actually have a need to if you're creating um, an anthology or if you're creating an archive of your magazines, you may not have a need to ever go back and add to that content. It may be one library for each year or something of that nature. But if that's important, it's good to, to think of that up front and to plan your content strategy. And when we get into the third pillar, it's uh, looking at how users are going to access your library. So are they going to be coming from a work computer, from home, from multiple locations? Uh, these are all factors to consider. And also for connections, are they coming across a, a local area or wide area network? And is your e-library, if you're talking in the case of an internal e-library, which many of you are working on, is it only available through the network or through a, a virtual private network or a VPN connection? Because if that's the case, then there are some considerations with tie into your user management functionality that you'll need to consider as well. Um, if it's broadly available over the internet, you'll look at things like, is there a login required? We're going to look at that in a little more detail. And you know, you can package your e-libraries on a DVD or CD or a USB drive if there's a requirement to be very portable with those and have the ability to access those offline as well. These are all factors. And if we were talking about login, and login is actually, it's a, it's a funny thing because quite often when we're talking with individuals, they'll say, you know, oh, we just need a login. Just put a username and password on the front of that application. And, and the, it can really be quite complex, especially if you have a requirement to tie into a user management uh, tool or to tie into current processes within your organization. So it's something that you really do need to consider up front and to make part of your core uh, plan. The other element you'll want to look at is if you need multi-layer authentication. So if you're in an industry that is highly regulated, then it is important to also consider whether you need to use biometrics or access cards or anything of that nature in order to make that login process a little more secure. The other factor with access is to think about the actual hardware that users are going to be accessing your e-library with. So do you need to support Windows or Mac or Linux? Um, is there a need for mobile device support? And this is becoming increasingly more popular as well as phones start to take on more of the attributes of, of uh, PDAs. Uh, cell phones are a viable platform for accessing a lot of resources. So this is something you'll want to consider. When you're looking at your e-library, um, the other factor I wanted to mention is that many organizations try to think of their e-library as really the be-all and end-all solution for content management and content display. 
And what I would encourage you to do is to take a look at the fit within the ecosystem of your organization and to see where your e-library um, will fit best and what solutions you already have in place today. So if you are already using a CRM solution to manage users, and if you're using uh, perhaps a digital rights management system on your content or a content management system, your e-library doesn't necessarily need to replace any of these factors, but it certainly does need to play nice with them. Um, and it needs to potentially talk to and connect with them. So looking at a solution that is um, SOA-based or software-oriented architecture uh, that has the ability to connect to other elements within your ecosystem is really key. So uh, if we're looking uh, from the back end now to the front end, if we talk about designing for the user, the user experience is very critical with any of these types of applications where you're asking users to take the lead and to do research. So certainly the user experience is very important. And when I talk about user experience, it's not just the user interface. So just to keep this in mind. When we're talking about the user interface, what that means is all of the visual appearance and the interactive behaviors and capabilities of the software. So how it looks when you, when you pull it up on screen is essentially the user interface. When we're talking about user experience, it's all points of contact related to your application. So if you're issuing a username password and sending information by email, if you're um, allowing users to purchase content through your e-library, that entire scope and process is really the user experience. So it does include um, how it looks, but how it, inter it interacts with the user as well. So that's important to consider. When we're talking about users, it's really important to also look at when you're designing the experience for your users, the types of users that you have. And many organizations think, Oh, well, it just has to be usable by everybody all the time. Well, that's true, but there really are three categories of users that you'll want to design the experience to fit. And the first group is the first-time user, so somebody who's never engaged with your e-library that's coming for the first time. And for this group, what you'll want to make sure that you do is you provide some quick start help so that when they arrive at your e-library, whether they're internal users or they're you know, members of the general public, that they get there and they're not faced with a blank screen and they're not sure where to go. So providing some guidance as to how to use the library it could be a quick flash movie, it could be an introduction, um, uh, it could be uh, you know a little help file at the beginning. Something that provides that that guidance is important. You'll also want to look at providing feedback on actions. So it's very important that if the user clicks search, that there's something that tells them that a search is taking place, whether it's a little spinning hourglass or something of that nature, so that they understand that they're waiting for information to populate. And you'll want to make sure that things are very clear and simple with not a very cluttered interface, something very clean and, and simple. You'll also want to look at the occasional user. So this may be somebody who comes to your e-library three or four times a month or a couple times a year. And then they're not starting from scratch each time, so they don't want to have to sit through some sort of mandatory quick start or help. But they want those tools available to them. So you can use things like cookies or logins to manage the users so that when they come back a second time, you can recognize them as returning. Say, you know, welcome back, Jane. Um, here's a quick tip about a new search function that's available. These are really nice little uh, enhancements that can help make the user experience a, a lot better. So offering tool tips and other reminders, providing search history. So if Jane has to come back and search the same information every six months, she's got that history of what she was looking for last time she was there. Um, and also providing entry helpers. So if there's a, a term that you're entering into a field, that there's a quick Quick complete that says, you know, are you looking for information about this? Um, similar to Google when you search and it says, were you looking for? <laughs> um, these tools can be very helpful for us. And you don't want to forget the productivity user. So people that are in your library every day that are looking for information that may be, you know, researchers or salespeople that are looking for detailed information that are quite savvy computer users, they're going to expect all of the functions and the the experience they would have on a desktop application in many cases. So they'll look for things like, uh, you know, Control-C and all of these functions to do cut and paste and, 
and uh, to do uh, right menu clicks, etc. They'll also want to. They'll also be very aware of the fact if your e-library doesn't follow expected behavior. So if a button's a button, it should be a button and function like a button. So make sure that the way that your user interface is, is designed and your experience is developed, that it really is following the needs of these three types of user. We talked a little bit earlier about content and looking at day two of your e-library and where you take the content from there. So it's really important when you're looking at best practices and you're looking at building your business case for your e-library project that you think about the content strategy and you really dig into who is going to be responsible for adding content, what technical skills that person has, what process they're going to follow, and what tools that may be necessary for them to complete this task. Um, it's really important to also think about future needs for your e-library. So even though you may not have a requirement for video or for MP3 files today, that's something that you'll want to be able to make sure your, your chosen technology supports in the future so that if your library grows and the resources change, that you still have the ability to support those. And when we're talking about delivering content, one of the key elements that you'll want to keep in mind is how to keep the lowest barrier to entry. So that's especially true if you're, if you're targeting an unknown group of users or the general public, as we would say, um, where you've got audiences coming with all different system configurations, all different types of knowledge, all different understandings of technology. You'll want to make sure you keep that threshold low. And when I say that, what I really am, uh, am stressing here is that you minimize the use of third-party tools and technology so that you don't force users outside of your e-library to look at documents or to view files or to play video so that you can integrate as much as possible that experience so that it's a controlled environment and the content is seamlessly supported. Uh, you'll also want to make sure that you keep the cognitive barriers very low for the application as well, and that it's very simple, it's very lean, quick to load, and it's very responsive, and it's cross-platform as well, so that there isn't going to be any issue if somebody on a Linux system comes up through a standard browser and, and lands at your e-library and, and winds up with a, oh, I'm sorry, we don't support you. Uh, so it's important to test on many different platforms and to ensure that you're aware of the limitations from a technology perspective if you do have any and you communicate such. But ideally you should be able to, to come up with a solution that uh, does have a very low barrier to entry. Um, when we're talking about delivering content, it's also important not to rethink the entire content strategy for your organization just because you're adding an e-library. So it's very possible and it's very recommended to look at your processes that are in place today and to provide integration for the common use cases on content creation or acquisition. So it's important to look at things like your CRM, your DRM, your website and your intranet and your network, as well as your content management tools and document creation tools to ensure that you've got the flow and that you're not breaking the processes that are in place because it can be a very, very steep learning curve if you're asking your front-end users to change the way they find information and your back-end users to change the way they produce and deliver that information, it can create quite a, a challenge within your organization. The other factor that is really key is to respect those rights and roles and hierarchies that we mentioned earlier. So if somebody has the rights in the paper world to retain documents, they should have that right in the electronic world as well. And you'll also want to look at copyright. Now, I could do a whole session just on copyright, to be honest, because there are so many factors to consider. And I would say that as industry professionals in this space, you know quite a bit about this topic already, 